people tell me, oh, I'm eating a carnivore diet and it's not working. And I'm like, well, are you eating the hot dog diet? Because that's carnivore. Anything that tastes good, people can overconsume. They overconsume butter. I definitely had that problem with butter. The thing that stalls weight loss is overconsumption. And if you're not filled up and if you're not feeling satisfied and full, then if you keep eating, then it's going to be hard to lose weight. I am five foot two inches tall. I'm very short and I eat about 25 to 2,800 calories in a day. The amount of people who come to me and are eating that much, zero. Before we start this episode, I just wanna say a big thank you for everything that we have achieved together. You see, two months ago, 75% of viewers had not subscribed, and now it's down to 71%. And our goal is 50%. So if you've ever liked any of the videos I post on this channel, please hit that subscribe button. Because as you've seen, the bigger the channel grows, the better the guests I can get for you. Okay, let's just get into the episode. Lily, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me again. Well, you know what? The one thing I absolutely love about your channel is that you make carnival so simple and so fun, and you share so many things about what you eat in a day and how to make carnival so practical. But there are some carnival approved foods that we really shouldn't be eating, especially if your goal is weight loss or if you want to heal inflammation. So today I wanted to talk about the 10 worst carnival foods that we shouldn't be eating. And I don't want to be too negative. So we're going to get to five or six um, carnival foods that Lily does have every single day. But let's first start off with the number one carnival food that we should not be eating. Well, I think it really depends on everyone's goals. And if the goal is weight loss, or if the goal is to heal, my first thing would be to look at the ingredients of everything that someone's eating. Because for example, something like hot dogs, I think is a great if it's a 100% beef hot dog, I think that's a great food option. But if it has things on the ingredients label, like dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, um, like corn starch, like I've seen so many different ingredients inside of hot dogs. And when it comes to weight loss specifically, people can lose weight eating a donut diet. People can lose weight eating a vegan diet. People can lose weight eating a Mediterranean, paleo, keto. People can lose weight eating a bunch of different ways of eating. I wouldn't do particular ones like the pizza donut diet because sure, maybe I can lose weight, but now I'm going to have worse skin and joint pain and sugar cravings. And I'm, there's just so many other, so I'm not trying to promote the pizza donut diet. But with that being said too, if I were to just eat hot dogs, I think that sometimes we don't explain enough in YouTube videos that if I were to say, okay, avoid hot dogs and somebody avoids it, but then there's still eating five sticks of butter and 15 ribeyes in one day, and they do that every single day, they're probably not gonna lose weight. So it's not necessarily avoid the hot dogs because the hot dogs mean I'm not going to lose weight. It's let's just be more mindful and cautious of what's inside the foods. And then we wanna have those things that are truly adding health. So if I'm eating a hot dog that has sugar and added ingredients that are not healthy for me, then in the long run, I don't know if that's going to help someone with their goals and their inflammation and um, satiety too, because even those things could spike our insulin and make us crave other foods if that has um, too much sugar. Absolutely. I totally agree. And that's where these 10 foods that we're talking about, they are coming from an animal. So technically they are, you know, in the bucket of carnival, but it's something that we do need a question because as, as you said, is it the most nutrient dense food that we could be eating? Hot dogs is a great example. Is that your first carnival food that you'd probably avoid? I guess, I guess what I think of like, sometimes people tell me they're eating a carnivore diet and I'm like, okay, that doesn't really tell me what you're eating because if you're just eating chicken breast, that is technically carnivore, but is that giving you all the nutrients that you need just eating chicken breast? Where's the fat? Where's the, um, you know, magnesium. <laughs> so people tell me, oh, I'm eating a carnivore diet and it's not working. And I'm like, well, are you eating the hot dog diet? Because that's carnivore. Um, so tell me more about what you're actually eating because carnivore can mean so many things. Absolutely. And what is it about hot dogs for people that might not know, which is not particularly the most nutrient dense for us? Well, it's a processed meat. Like I think of something like a ribeye. That's like full spectrum nutrients. Whereas like oftentimes with hot dogs, they add other fillers and stuff. You can get some ground beef and that's going to have um, more vitamins and minerals and nutrients and fat content and the right kind of fat content and not likely going to have added sugars and 
um, fillers in the ground beef. And if you can't afford like expensive ground beef or anything, we're not saying don't have hot dogs. They're a better option. And that's what I love that you said in your video, hot dogs or salami is better than a processed pizza, but ground beef is better than hot dogs. So it's kind of like that hierarchy, which is, okay, I will choose this over this and I'll choose mm -hmm. this over this for my health goals. So I love how you put it very clear and very, very simple. What is your number two carnival food that is not so good for us if we have weight loss goals? I would say cheese, particularly pasteurized cheese. And the reason I say cheese, partic particularly with weight loss is just because you know, we don't realize I've made a carnival pizza before where I'm using like cheese for the crust and then putting cheese on the top and then just to like make it extra gooey, cheesy, adding even more cheese. And you don't realize like I just put like 15 servings of cheese on this pizza. So with the cheese, it's easy to, OK, I'm going to just put some shredded cheese. OK, if you put a serving, great, that should be fine. Um, again, it's just like quantity. So if you're just doing a serving, that's fine. But if you're doing like 15 servings, it's easy to overeat cheese, especially because it has a uh, dairy has an addictive component to it. And so people may think like, oh, I'm just having like, you know, some cheese and it turns into like a lot of cheese real quick. Um, but as far as like pasteurization goes, so essentially with dairy, if we have raw dairy, then when we heat it up, the good thing about doing that is it kills off the bad bacteria. So this is why dairy products in the grocery store have a longer shelf life. And people can buy something that's, you know, been in the grocery store for a week, two weeks, three weeks, and then put it in their home. And it has an expiration date of a month. Whereas with raw dairy, I have to get it from my local farmer and then consume it within a week. So there's also a difference between A1 cows and A2 cows. So A1 is more of the newer breed of cow. And A2 is more of the ancestral cow that's been a part of our lineage longer. So if someone is noticing I'm having lactose intolerant like symptoms, again, it could be because it's not A2. If you're having inflammation and you're not feeling your best having dairy, it's maybe not the dairy in particular, it's just the kinds of dairy. But then again, as far as like weight loss goes, it can be easy to overconsume. I love that you said that because I am so intolerant to dairy. If I have yogurt, cheese, anything, anything dairy, I will get acne, bloating. I'd love to know anyone watching, are you intolerant to dairy? Do you have dairy? Have you tried raw dairy, as Lily is saying, because it is so beneficial. But I know that another controversial thing, along with the pasteurized cheese, is milk, because people love their milk. So is it the same deal with milk? I'm sure it is, but I'll ask you anyway. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I was actually told I was lactose intolerant. So my whole life, I did not drink milk. I did not have cheese. Um, I actually don't really love the taste of cheese. So I don't usually have too much cheese just because of like mouth pleasure. I don't enjoy cheese that much. Um, but I, again, when I tried having raw dairy for the first time, and even like the A2, it could, you know, I know in the US, it can be harder to find raw dairy, but if the, even the A2 and it's not raw can still be um, easier to digest or looking out for sheep's and goat's cheese, because all of those should be A2. So um, yeah, as far as dairy goes and the milk goes again, people can overconsume anything. So some people, they tell me they overconsume butter and that they're now binge eating on butter or that they're gaining weight eating butter because anything that tastes good, people can overconsume bacon, pork belly. So it's not that, you know, it's really hard to say for me that like this food's bad or this food's not going to help you lose weight because it just depends on how much you're consuming. I definitely had that problem with butter. I recently, well, the last six months, I increased my butter intake and it was getting close to one stick to one and a half sticks of butter a day to the point, honestly, I was addicted. I was not even hungry and going to the fridge and just getting that sliver of butter. I thought, oh, it's carnival. Oh, it's really high fat. It's good for my sugar addiction. It's great. And then I found that as I was addicted to sugar previously, I was getting addicted to butter. So that's a change that I made with my uh, diet, which is to have less butter. I'm still having my fatty latte. I'm still having a bit, but am I really having less butter because I like, I can't, even going to KetoCon and thinking, oh my God, I can't have my fatty latte. I can't have my butter. It gave me like, I was feeling nervous, nervous around it. And so I think that attachment to certain foods, when you're so attached to it, it's not a good thing. Um, so it, yeah, as you said, butter, bacon, all these things that you can overconsume, we definitely need to be more careful about it. But you did mention going back to the first one, hot dogs. I know there's some other processed 
meats that we shouldn't be eating. What are those? If you want faster fat loss results, we have lots of courses, live classes, and free resources to help you, including the seven-day fasting course for fat loss that will teach you the four fasting techniques to get you into ketosis and start burning fat no matter what diet you are following. And if you're carnivore, you might like the ultimate four-week fat loss course, which will teach you the right amount of protein and fat to drop the pounds fast on a carnivore diet. Simply click the link in the description or the pinned comment to get 20% off automatically, or just head to academy.5minutebody.com and use the code YT20. There's salami, there's pepperoni, um, those are processed meats. Now, pro everything is processed. So it's like ground beef is processed. And it's not that people, again, shouldn't be eating them. It's just dependent. Like I have people who seriously, if they have something that has extra seasonings or extra cornstarch or whatever they put inside these um, processed meats, they will have more arthritic pain. They will have more digestive issues from just a small amount. Now for myself, I can eat pepperoni and salami and I will be okay. I was intimidated the first time I was walking around the grocery store with my husband and he would pick up the ingredients label and read it. And I was like, what are you looking for? You know, this is years ago. I was like, what is on that ingredients that you are putting it back and saying, no, I don't want to eat that. It just kind of starts with going to the grocery store, turning over the, the ingredients and then seeing, okay, it says celery powder. Do I have a pr problem with celery powder? I personally don't, but somebody else may have arthritic pain. You know, I, I think about Michaela Peterson. She, you know, certain things are going to cause her to, not feel her best. So I'm, so I'm not trying to say like, if you Rena have salami, then you're not going to thrive. You may thrive on salami, but other people, they just have to be more mindful of that. I'm so glad that you said that because it's not a one size fits all. And I did an interview with Dr. Ken Berry and he was saying, look, if you can just afford the hot dogs, the processed meats, go ahead. The, the spam. I know people that have spam and oh, yeah. they do so great on it, but then you have some people that don't do so great on it. So, you know, differentiating what works well for you, what doesn't work well for, well for you is so important. The same way that we have different ways of doing carnival, high fat carnival, high protein carnival, um, protein spraying modified carnival. It's a bit mind boggling. So all these like different trends that we have. Um, raw carnivore. Raw. Oh, what is this raw meat carnival? Yeah. And then there's, um, there's modified carnivore, lazy carnivore, dirty carnivore, hyper carnivore, lion diet carnivore, dairy carnivore. I'm like, I don't even know what a carnivore diet is anymore because people will say like, oh, I'm eating carnivore. I'm like, so like I will make YouTube videos where I'm like, okay, I'm not showing any plant foods. I'm not even putting seasonings. I'm not even like, you know, people drink coffee or have tea or something I'm like I'm not, I'm not showing any plants. And they're like, you're still not doing carnivore, right? Because you're, you're having dairy. Really? Or you're still not doing carnivore, right? Because you're not eating your meat raw. And I'm like, oh. Because you had bacon. Oh. I'm like, what? Wow. So it's, well, it can be confusing. Just eat the meat that makes you feel the best. I think my audience is very relaxed or they're not as finicky. Maybe I don't show like, I mean, actually I show like what I eat. It's beef and butter. And I never get any comments around any, probably because I just make it so simple. Maybe the question they ask is, do you only eat those two things and do you eat anything else? And probably I don't eat anything else. So that's the comments I get. It's not like, oh, you're eating this and that and all these different things. But yeah, it just shows that there's so much variation in how we do yeah. different things, but you really have to go back with what works for you because what works for Lily and me might not work for you. So we have to really test and trial and even do the lion diet is good. If you have some allergies or inflammation, you need to take everything out, see how you feel, introduce some foods back in and see how you feel. So it's all that kind of trial and error. And as Lily is saying, this is not like a once all be all that you can never touch these foods. But if you're having a weight loss stall, if, if you're struggling in any way, these could be some foods that you might think you can eat but maybe they're not so good for you. So that's kind of why we're talking about these things. Not to confuse you, trying to make it a little bit simple if if that's possible. Um, so what is the next carnival food that maybe we should be avoiding? I eat chicken, but I don't eat rotisserie chicken. And I <laughs> think that, I think if someone buys a rotisserie chicken, I would just take the skin off because I would mainly be most concerned with the skin. Um, and I love chicken skins. They're a great source of fat, but um, particularly like in the grocery store here in the US with rotisserie chickens, like I just went to the grocery store the other day and read off the ingredients, potato starch, dextro dextrose. Um, they have, there's just so many added ingredients to, I think the outsides, I don't think they're putting it inside the chicken. So as long as someone's taking off the chicken skins, then um, I think it should be okay. But for the most part, 
Um, just always goes back to those ingredients because they sneak them in there. You're like, oh, I'm just buying meat. I'm just buying beef jerky. Okay, well, they're putting stuff in that. Well, again, I didn't know. So when you said the roast chicken, I was just like, what? Roast chicken? I can't have roast chicken. What? And then you showed me all the ingredients and I was like, oh my goodness, she is so right. We should not be, well, we have to look at the ingredients because nine times out of 10, you're going to see more than one ingredient, which is not just chicken. And probably they're going to use seed oils. I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, the right. seed oils are the cheapest oils that you can make to cook chicken, yeah. to roast chicken. So you really have to think twice about it. And I know a lot of these things too, like we said, like pepperoni, salami, these things are very affordable. So you would think like, oh, it's just like a affordable meat, but they're really not like the, it, compared to the size. Like if you see something like ham, sliced ham, if it's how much ham are you really going to eat? If you eat a pound of ham, you're probably not going to feel the, the best. That's why they put them in those slices. Whereas like you can eat a whole pound of ground beef and usually don't have, you know, most, well, it's a lot of meat in one sitting, but um, you think that they're more affordable, but they're not because not only are you getting, getting less vitamins and minerals and nutrients overall, but just um, the quantity for the price. I think people that like, they see just like a small bag of ham and they're like, oh, it's only a dollar, but really you can get a whole pound of beef for five dollars but they make it seem like oh it's only a dollar so i'm gonna grab that but um they're actually more expensive per pound so how would you recommend people to compare different things ham versus beef what what do you look at to see which is a better value well something that people could use is an app called chronometer on chronometer it will not only show the micronutrients but it'll also show the macronutrients so that's pretty a huge indicator when you can see wait i'm paying two dollars for chicken and I'm getting hundred calories, 10 grams of fat and 20 grams of protein. And then the beef I'm paying $5, but I'm getting 600 calories and 40 grams of fat. It's just like the numbers you can see right there. Oh, okay. I'm actually getting way less nutrients, my macronutrients, but also those micronutrients, I'm getting way less iron, way less magnesium. Um, so I would go on chronometer, I would say is the, probably the first thing, obviously when you're at the grocery store, you can't really see that, but I know in my Costco, they will actually show the price per pound. So if you're looking at the price and it says 29 99 for beef and you're like, well, that's a lot of money, but then it'll say per pound, it's like $4 per pound. Whereas you go to the chicken and the chicken says it's $10 and you're like, so that's way less money. But then it says the price per pound is $6 and you're like, oh, sneaky, sneaky. It's very, very sneaky. And another tip is even prior to going to the grocery store, make a list of what you want to buy and look at those micronutrients and macronutrients previously to know what are the most nutrient dense foods that I want to buy. You go to the store when you're not hungry, you're full with your beef and butter. And then you just go and buy those things so that you're not impulse shopping or you're not buying something on sale because usually most carnivores, they eat the same things on repeat. And I know we're going to talk about what you eat most days, most days, and you do eat other things. But a lot of people that find success, they do eat a lot of the same foods every day. They tend to be high in nutrient value and they tend to be budget friendly. So when we see the ham or we see a special or turkey or something, it is good to go for it if if you want to. But the staple is really going to be those you know few things that we eat every single day. I think when we overcomplicate things, then it's harder to stay on track. So if someone yeah. has all these different options of things, they think they have to go and, you know, grab this whole huge list of, I got to go to the grocery store and buy this, 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 this. And then I got to make this extravagant meal. Like I know for myself, like I just do the, oh, I just beef. But then I think, oh, people want to have uh, YouTube videos where they see me eat something other than beef. So now I'm going to make this pie, this pizza, this carnivore, this, that, and the other. And nobody ends up liking it or like being interested in that kind of video because people don't want to overcomplicate it. They don't have the time. They just want to be able to make their food, enjoy the rest of their day, um, make it for a family. And so like, we think like, oh, people want to have like the quiche or something. So you have to show them different kinds of recipes, but they're like, no, just tell me eggs. Got it. Beef. Got it. I totally agree. What is the next food that we should not maybe be avoiding on the carnival lifestyle? I don't eat tuna personally. I avoid tuna mainly for the mercury content, but then also like nutritionally, I can get more out of a sardine and I can pay less for money for it too. So um, with canned fish, I would just be particular to again, look for seed oils, vegetable oils, but even fruit oils. So like olives are a fruit. So olive oils can be snuck inside those cans. Now I personally don't have a problem if somebody wants to eat olive oil, but there is a difference between real olive oil and like, I'm actually canola oil, olive oil. So companies usually want to use the cheapest ingredients possible to make their food. 
So I personally was eating sardines in olive oil. I didn't think much of it, but I always had diarrhea after I'd eat them. And then later I just ended up buying the same brand of sardines in water and then the diarrhea went away. So there's a stat out there that I think some over 80% of avocado and olive oils are actually rancid and they may even have canola or vegetable oils in them. So there are real olive oils out there. They're pretty expensive and they're likely not going to be in products um, like mixed in as an ingredient. They're usually just gonna be a bottle on their own as real olive oil. Um, so just something to be aware of is just like if you're when we're buying canned fish to look at the ingredients again, look out for the seed oils, vegetable oils and fruit oils and um, just like the mercury content in general for canned fish because it's already in a can on top of it, too. So that those, those are more heavy metals and aluminum. I totally agree. I had I had a similar experience with um, sardines because I'm, I'm going to do a sardine fast and I had some sardines and mackerel. And then I was thinking, why am I feeling so ill after? And then I messaged like some of my group members and they said, oh, usually sardines packed in oil is cut with seed oils. I said, what? It's labeled olive oil. So even if you see a label of olive oil, it is cut. What Lily is saying. I was shocked. I was like, what the heck? Like, this is annoying. Do I just have to eat beef and butter all the time? I can't just eat something different. But unfortunately, if something is cheap and it's canned, they're probably not going to have the most high quality ingredients. Yeah, it depends. I mean, I have canned canned sardines that are in just water. Um, they do taste like old fish to me, though. So I think <laughs> like there's a way to get like in a glass sardines. I don't have all. I'm sure I could maybe find something online, but um, to get something in glass would be better. But I personally do have canned fish, and I. But that's a great tip. Is- Buy it in water. I'm gonna do that. Thanks, Lily. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, um, what is the next carnival food that we should be avoiding? I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I would just look out for the beef jerkies. I love beef jerky. It's a super easy, convenient snack and thing to take on the go, but they they will put soybean oil, canola oil. Um, it's pretty impressive. Actually, the beef jerkies I find to be the worst ingredients. Usually like I have spent time in Costco where I went through every single beef jerky and it was like pretty much hands down. All of them had soybean oil or some sort of even soy um, in it. And then dextrose, sugar. And again, these things don't actually stall weight loss. The thing that stalls weight loss is overconsumption. And if you're not filled up and if you're not feeling satisfied and full, then if you keep eating, then it's going to be hard to lose weight. Absolutely. Now, what are the last two things that we should not be or kind of avoiding? If our goal is health as well as weight loss, longevity, what are those two things? I would say protein powders and protein bars. Now, again, I have protein powder, the ingredients, um, there is one that is just one ingredient, unflavored beef protein, 100% grass fed beef protein isolate. There's a beef option. So I know even people who have sensitivities to dairy, again, there's going to be that way that casing, um, in a lot of protein powders. So there is a beef option unless someone can tolerate dairy, then the way one can be good, but, um, they will, you know, protein powders that is, is like a long list of a Bible of ingredients on those guys. Like and that big. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I actually will do ones that have, sorry, this probably goes against what you talk about in your videos, but stevia, because for myself, I don't have a problem with having stevia. But um, so I have like the same protein powder that has like a sweet taste to it. So it's like, you don't have to just do plain protein powder. There are flavored ones. It just like depends on what's the ingredients again, but, um, and then protein bars. So um, I haven't really found a protein bar unless we're talking like a carnivore bar as a protein bar, but I would called a carnivore bar more like a fat bar since it's mainly fat but um protein bars again just like a long list of ingredients and things that they will put sugar and again the amount of sugar is very small so just depends on what people want to eat like is a protein bar worse than having a candy bar no a candy bar is going to be worse than eating a protein bar so if someone's option is to have you know i like to think of food on a scale so over here i'm going to say it's like liver salmon bones blood, any kind of organ and sure beef (laughs) can go in the like most nutrient dense foods possible. And then we got the, oh, and eggs. Then we have things like chicken, pork, lamb. Those things would fall, you know, more animals. Then we got even to like the processed meats. Then we go into like fruits and veggies. Then we have crackers and breads. And then we have like candies and sodas. So it's like, you got to think of things on a scale. So if someone tells me like, oh, is cheese bad? I'm like, well, what kind of cheese? 
Are you having shredded cheese with fillers with like dextrose in it? Or are you having raw A2 grass finished cheese and you can tolerate it? But then if you're having the shredded cheese, that's way better than having the crackers. I love how you visually talk about it because some some people are visual people. I'm a visual person. So if you're on that scale, I'm like, hey, look, most of the time I'm eating here. Sometimes I might creep in here, but I'm coming back here the next day. But it's okay. It's on that spectrum to say I was here and then I was here. Then I graduated here. But some days if I'm not sleeping, have my period or something, Maybe I might take a step back, but I'm always going back to where I was before for the majority of the time. So what do you eat on most days? Because you eat five or six of the same foods. I eat ground beef, particularly ground beef, not steaks, not brisket or, or chuck roast. Ground beef every single day. I've done that every day for the last like two and a half years. So there was one day where I was like, I am so overeating ground beef. So I had like fish and shrimp and didn't have any ground beef. So I was like, that was like a, a gift to myself. <laughs> it was one day of no ground beef. But um, I also think too, if people are like, how do you eat ground beef all the time? I was just thinking about this this morning, how my farmer's ground beef is so tasty and good. And I've had other ground beef, which is just not good tasting, or you get tired of the taste. So sometimes if people are like, I'm bored of ground beef, it could be that you're the like now that I've had my farmer's ground beef, I'm like addicted to it. So it's way more expensive than buying re regular ground beef. So he got me stuck and addicted to it. But um, the kind and quality of ground beef, I think makes a huge difference. And then I add salt. Oh, so salt's the other thing that I have every day too. So ground beef, salt, I have raw milk every day. Um, I do the raw milk because I am trying to build muscle. I tend to under eat on carnivore naturally. So if I were to listen to my body, I would naturally under eat. Now, when I've done that in the past, that meant I was going to be cold in the morning. I was going to start losing more of my hair. I could have in the long run lost my menstrual cycle. My mood could have gotten worse, my sleep, my energy levels, but I pretty quickly realized, oh, wow, I'm eating so little. So it's very easy to under eat on carnivore just because the foods are so nutrient dense and satiating and protein heavy. Um, so I find for myself, I actually need to have some of those carbs from milk because it actually makes me hungrier. So that is my strategy to actually gain weight. So if someone's like, I'm not trying to gain weight, probably having dairy or just like raw milk would not be in your best interest because for myself, it makes me hungrier and I intentionally want that so I can be hungry to sit down for my meal. Because usually um, if I sit down for my ground beef meal and then later have more ground beef, I am not even hungry for that second meal. So, um, those are, those are three things. I also will have electrolytes each day. Um, mainly because, well, two reasons I like the taste. So I have ones that are flavored. Um, but I also will get really bad eye twitches at one point too. I did have muscle cramping in the, in my hip, but, um, for the main, for the most part, it's actually been my eye that has been twitching like crazy. So I do have electrolytes. Wow. And, um, then I have raw yogurt at the end of the night too. That's kind of like, instead of having ice cream or like I personally love dessert. I've had dessert my whole life. And I found that when I had times with carnivore where I didn't have dessert, I was less happy. And I'm not trying to eat this way to be less happy. I'm trying to eat this way to thrive and feel my best. So for myself, I like that raw yogurt because it's just like my dessert and my sweet treat. And um, so it's like my, my form of having ice cream. And then I have butter every day. <laughs> and uh, I love, love, love the taste of butter, but I mainly add the butter for more fat content and to increase my overall food intake, AKA calories. I know calories is like a weird word and we don't really know what calories means, but, um, again, if I'm under eating butter is just an easy way for me to boost that calorie number or overall food intake pretty quickly and to increase that fat content. So if I have something lean like chicken, venison, bison, elk, or any fish or lean meats, the butter is like an easy tool for me to add more fat. Pork belly is great too. I just don't have it every day, but that's a great way to add fat because it's so tasty. Perfect. Well, so there's a list of, of foods that you can eat quite safely, quite easily. The raw milk, that's quite interesting. I've never tried raw milk, but I really want to try it. I'm not trying to gain weight, but I just think it's a really good option because sometimes you do get sick of just having beef and butter and eggs and bacon and salmon and sardines. So changing it up, even the raw yogurt, I would love to try that. I wouldn't have the stevia. And I'm <clears throat> so I'm not against stevia. It's just that it triggers me. That's yeah. the only thing. And and I I would love to have it because because I love the taste of it, but I used to eat 
half a jar of stevia out of the thing with peanut butter. So I'm not going to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, the raw yogurt, it would just be divine. Um, you did mention something quite interesting, the concept of under eating. Can you explain what does that mean around under eating? Maybe not in terms of calories, if you don't want to say that word, energy, or what's a level for women and men watching that they might be under eating? How would they know? Someone may know that they're under eating actually based on if they're not losing weight, which I know seems so ironic because you would think if I'm trying to lose weight, then I need to eat less food. Now, time and time again, I work with people one-on-one -on -one and I find that if they come to me and they're under eating, the first thing I say is and they're not losing weight. I say, well, clearly what you're doing isn't working. So let's try the opposite eat more food. Their body is in starvation mode. And so their body doesn't know that right down the street, they have a grocery store for all it knows is you're stranded in the middle of, de of a deserted Island. And so it's trying to keep you alive. So it is holding on to the small amount of food that someone's giving it. So that way it can do the most important functions as in like moving your blood throughout your body, blinking your eyes, breathing, but then it's going to slowly start getting rid of it because it's not getting enough fuel. It's not getting enough energy to do what it needs to do. It's going to start shutting down, AKA losing its hair, losing its menstrual cycle, doing things that losing energy, not feeling, you know, you're going to, the body is going to slowly start shutting down processes because it needs fuel to do it. So if someone is questioning whether or not they're eating enough, you know, personally, I say to track your calories for a day. Now I know some people, they don't want to track their calories every day. I don't track my calories, but it's good to know like one time every six months, where am I at? Because it's pretty easy to slide back down into under eating. So I would say for every single adult, just like a broad number is 1800 calories, but then there's going to be a lot more variation because that would be for particularly a woman who is sedentary, like older woman who is sedentary. Um, but after that, I would say mainly most humans, adults should eat 2000 calories. And that's like on the low end, I am five foot two inches tall. I'm very short. And I eat about 25 to 2,800 calories in a day. The amount of people who come to me and are eating that much, zero. <laughs> like the majority of people who come to me are eating like 1,200 calories. And for my personal body, I have done a, a scan before where it shows that if I was in a coma and I'm in the hospital, AKA they are feeding me through a tube and I'm just laying there, not blinking, not talking, not moving at all. And they're feeding me it would require 1200 calories to keep me alive. And a lot of people are eating 1200 calories and um, they're functioning for now, but I would, you know, I, that, that's it's on my heart so much about the under eating. Cause I was doing it. And I know that there, there's a lot of long-term consequences and people will come to me and saying, carnivore's not working. I feel low energy. I'm not sleeping as good. I'm losing my hair. I'm losing my menstrual cycle. And it, it's not that the carnivore diet or beef is making you lose your hair. It's the amount of food that somebody is consuming. I can understand where you're coming from. I did the same thing. That's why I asked the question because I think a lot of people do the same thing without knowing because we've been told this for so many decades to under eat, to count your calories. But with a carnival lifestyle, let's just call it carnival lifestyle because it's the nutrient dense way of eating. You're feeding your body with so many nutrients so that your mitochondria, all your cells, your brain, your organs and everything can function properly. Who knows how many calories that is? I don't know, but if you count it for a day, maybe you might have a good idea, but it's so important so that we know that we're not under eating. And there's signs, as you mentioned, that you might be under eating. The last question I want to ask you is about protein because you eat 150 grams of protein a day. Is that something that you would say is a good benchmark for most people? I think I eat a lot of protein. I think I'm pretty high up there now. I'm trying to build muscle. I don't even, I don't work out that much. I think people think I work out a lot. I work out for an hour or five days a week. So, and I'm not like sweating by the end of it too. So I'm not doing like, I'm taking lots of rest, taking a lot of break. Um, but because my goal is to build more muscle, I, I am higher on protein than I think most people would want to be at. Now, what I, my reference point for like where to, to start for protein is I would just aim to eat my ideal body weight in terms of grams of protein per day. If I'm 110 pounds and I want to be that 120, I would aim to eat about 120 grams of protein. Or if I'm 120 pounds and I want to remain my same weight and not gain or lose, I would aim to eat about that 120. Now it doesn't have to be perfect. Someone can eat 150 or 80. It's just kind of a reference point on like, where do I begin? I would just aim to eat my ideal body weight, not the body weight I currently am, but the goal weight that I would like to be. 
and start there. Now, some people, they may see that they may think if they're doing one meal in a day and they eat, you know, 180 grams of protein, cause that's their goal weight. If they're a diabetic or there's someone who has blood sugar issues and they're not pairing that with fat, they may see that their blood sugars stay in that elevated state and they don't come down for a while. And so I would separate and break out that protein into smaller meals. I find that people who are, have blood sugar issues or who are diabetics can usually do about 30 to 40 grams of protein in a sitting paired with fat to prevent that blood sugar spike and, and staying in that elevated state. So um, there is nuance like how much protein in one sitting, I would try to break it up a little bit more um, and it doesn't have to be perfect. And if someone finds that they're still staying in that elevated state, even with doing 30 to 40 grams of protein, it's okay to have less. So someone doesn't have to eat 180 grams of protein. I know there's people who do the more ketogenic approach where they're doing moderate protein and high fat. Um, and that works well too. So it's kind of just a starting point. And then you can go higher if you're hungrier and go lower if you're seeing negatives. That was the best explanation I've ever heard. <laughs> well, Lily, how can people find you? I am on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube at Lily Kane. Very, very easy. Well, thank you, Lily. You've been amazing. And I'm sure we're going to see you very soon.